Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Johns Hopkins Minimally Invasive Surgeons, Dr. Gina Andralis, Dr. Alyssa Coker, and Dr. Brenda Sosa will be speaking about surgical treatment options for GERD. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you're comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your email address will not be shared with any third parties and we will do our best to answer all questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Gina Adralis to begin our presentation. Thank you very much. We are so um, honored to have you join us today so that we can uh, share some information about acid reflux, a very common problem. Um, we'll just go to the first slide here. So we'll be talking tonight about the surgical treatment options for acid reflux. And I'd like to introduce uh, myself and uh, my partners. Uh, so I lead our division for minimally invasive surgery. Um, I'm joined tonight by Dr. Elisa Coker, um, who uh, joined us from the uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, where she completed her residency and fellowship. And uh, she's been at Hopkins about uh, five or six years now. And uh, Dr. Brenda Zosa, um, we are so pleased to have her join us uh, just this past year from the University of Wisconsin Fellowship. Um, prior to that, she uh, completed her uh, residency in Cleveland. Um, so uh, with that, we'll just dive right in. I wanna share with you a little bit about our division. Uh, so we primarily do our surgery through small incisions. Uh, that's our uh, minimally invasive surgery um, priority. And um, we perform those surgeries laparoscopically, also robotic assisted, and sometimes without any incisions through the endoscope. And you can see um, on the left there, we treat a variety of disease. Um, and we do so from a variety of locations, um, along with our three partners who are based in uh, Washington, DC at Sibley Hospital. Uh, we treat patients at Johns Hopkins uh, Bayview um, here in Baltimore as well. Um, Green Spring uh, Station also. Uh, tonight, we're going to be focusing on acid reflux and hiatal hernia. So acid reflux is a very common problem. Um, it's one of the most frequent GI diagnoses that's, uh, that are made and uh, amounts to over 9 million outpatient visits a year in the United States alone. There was a survey that was done recently um, which looked at 72,000 patients, and of those patients, two out of five said that they had acid reflux. Um, this disease means that there's acid from the stomach that washes up into the esophagus, and that can cause a number of issues. First, it can hurt. Um, it causes heartburn um, and chest discomfort. Uh, it can cause pain in the upper part of the abdomen area as well. Um, but importantly, it can cause inflammation in the esophagus and can uh, progress to the point where it causes ulcers or even narrowing of the esophagus where it can make it difficult to swallow. And in some cases, it can cause some cell changes over time that might increase the risk for cancer, and that's called Barrett's esophagus. Sometimes that fluid that comes up from the stomach can also go down the wrong pipe into the airways, and this can cause breathing issues, throat discomfort, uh, sometimes uh, frequent pneumonias. And overall, this can lower the quality of life. Um, risk factors can include um, tobacco use, um, having obesity, uh, the male sex men are at higher risk for that, as well as um, people who have advancing age. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna briefly go over uh, the digestive tract here. You can see that white dot moving through the esophagus. The esophagus is a muscular tube that propels our liquid and food down. So it um, squeezes uh, the esophagus um, and squeezes that food forward. And then the lower part of the esophagus will then relax, let that food go through and then tighten again. Um, so uh, in the next slide, you'll see this acid reflux barrier. Normally that lowest part of the esophagus is below the diaphragm as well as the stomach. And um, 
And the diaphragmatic support, as well as that lower part of the esophagus where that muscle squeezes tight, acts like a valve. So when that stomach is turning up that food and liquid, it keeps uh, fluid and acid, importantly, from going back up into the esophagus. But sometimes this can break down and, uh, and this can um, manifest as a hiatal hernia. So uh, sometimes the valve doesn't work and sometimes the lower part of the esophagus can slide up above the diaphragm. Um, and this can amount to gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD or acid reflux. You can see on the left side uh, that that valve, the um, sphincter of the lower part of the esophagus is tight. And so it keeps that fluid down where it belongs in the stomach. But when it opens up, um, that fluid can rise up into the esophagus and that's what can cause that heartburn. Um, so uh, what uh, leads to this? Well, the esophagus doesn't move well sometimes and as that valve is leaky, Sometimes that esophagus and the stomach are located in the wrong place, um, which uh, um, can cause acid reflux. And sometimes the stomach doesn't empty well. And uh, that can happen um, from a variety of diseases, but it also can happen because the stomach, in this case, with a large hiatal hernia, might migrate up above the diaphragm. Um, so you can see different types of hiatal hernia here in this picture. Sometimes it's small, like a sliding hiatal hernia, and often patients don't have symptoms from that. At other times, more of the stomach can come up to the chest and can cause other symptoms such as a shortness of breath, um, difficulty eating when you feel full earlier because uh, the food um, is very slow to empty through the entirety of the stomach. And sometimes there can be other organs, uh, not just the stomach, but the colon, for instance, that can migrate um, above the diaphragm. Now, opposed to um, just sort of mild acid reflux that sometimes can be controlled by medications. Uh, the hiatal hernia is really more of a surgical disease. It's a structural mechanical problem that only surgery can treat and medications in this case often aren't enough. Um, so next I'm gonna to transition to my colleague, Dr. Elisa Coker, who's going to share a little bit more about acid reflux and the variety of treatments and um, evaluations for this. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Dralis, and thank you for that great uh, explanation of what reflux is. I mean, I think we should be clear, we are surgeons uh, and we surgically treat reflux, but we're also experts in this disease process. And I think it's fair to understand all the mechanisms that go into it and different approaches to treating it so you can make the best decision for yourself. So I'm gonna focus on more of the non-surgical uh, options regarding reflux. And so the first question may be asking us, okay, is if you have reflux, how do you go about reducing it? And the way I think about it is the first, first thing you want to do is the lifestyle modification. Sometimes people figure this out on, by, on their own just by experimenting, um, but a lot of it's avoiding certain foods. I say it's always avoiding all the good things in life. So caffeine, alcohol, chocolate, peppermint in case you have an altoid addiction, uh, spicy foods, citrus, and tomato-based sauces in particular are really going to aggravate uh, reflux, uh, mainly because they're going to reduce the lower esophageal sphincter pressure. So you're just kind of opening up that gateway that Dr. Adralis was talking about so that acid can all go up into your esophagus. Once you've done that, you also want to use gravity in your favor. So if your valve isn't working very well, uh, you want to make sure you keep that acid down where it belongs. And so you, you do that by avoiding eating too close to going to bed, because anytime you eat, it's going to cause your acid to ramp your stomach to ramp up acid production so it can dissolve that food. So if you eat and then you lay down, that acid is just going to roll back into incline, because at least then, even while you're sleeping, you're letting uh, gravity work in your favor to try to keep that down where it belongs. So once you've done that, if you're still having symptoms is when we start looking at using medications, right? Uh, typically these fall into two categories, either neutralizing the acid that's there or reducing the secretions overall. So for neutralizing, those are, those are antacids, right? So these are the most popular products. A calcium carbonate is your Rolaids, Tums, Alka-Seltzer. And then there's also the Mylanta, Malox, Gaviscon, all of those are magnesium and aluminum hydroxides. Uh, these are typically more just an as needed uh, medication. So you take when you're actively having the sensation of heartburn, but if that's not gonna cut it, then you start working to taking more regular 
medication. So there's really two classes, the H2 blockers and the proton pump inhibitors. The H2 blockers, there used to be a couple on the market. Really, there's just the one now, it's famotidine. Uh, you'll see it under these different names like Zantac 360 uh, or Pepsid. And the proton pump inhibitors tend to work a little bit better. Um, and you can find them in both over-the-counter forms and prescription forms. So these are many of the different names you might recognize. So the brand names are commonly Nexium um, or Prevacid. And they do work very well. But of course, long term, some people are concerned about taking these. There are some concerns um, on long term use of PPIs in particular. Um, I'm not going to say they're really great quality studies, to be honest. And so it's all kind of risk versus benefit. But some of the studies that do have a little bit more convincing evidence are around things like osteoporosis, calcium absorption, and kidney disease. So if you're someone that already is predisposed to some of these problems um, or have concerns over that, like maybe a strong history of osteoporosis, or maybe you have one kidney, you might want to think carefully about whether you want to be on these medications for life. And it's just a discussion that you should have with your prescribing physician. Um, if you do decide that you want to proceed with a surgical intervention at the hopes of getting off of these medications or for better controlling your reflux, um, there's definitely some testing that you would typically go through. So probably the first thing your physician would recommend is an endoscopy. So this is similar to a colonoscopy, which many of us are familiar with, except you're going to go through the mouth. So it's a long tube with a camera. We go through your mouth. It does require sedation, basically sleepy time medication, but it's a same day procedure. So you would go home that day. You would just need a ride. Um, and what that's going to do is evaluate your anatomy, allow us to look for things like hiatal hernias or any kind of damage uh, we call esophagitis to the lower part of that esophagus, um, and also evaluate for those precancerous changes Dr. Giles mentioned, like Barrett's, um, and also strictures can be seen. So the strictures can develop after long-term exposure to acid in your esophagus. Uh, finally, an advantage of this test is it allows us to get biopsies. So a biopsy will definitively diagnose something like Barrett's or precancerous changes um, and can also identify tissue that's been damaged by ongoing reflux. When you get an endoscopy, the pictures look something like this. You're actually looking at the scope. They like said it allows you to evaluate uh, the valve itself to see if it's uh, too loose, maybe, which is allowing more acid to go through and several other variables. So next, you may want to get, your provider may recommend some type of definitive pH test. So this is going to actually tell us if you have acid reflux or not. So there's really two common forms of this. The first one is a Bravo pH test. And this is done in conjunction with upper endoscopy. So at the time of endoscopy, while you're under sedation, this goes down into your esophagus and it's a clip. So it'll be clipped six centimeters above that lower esophageal sphincter. And that's gonna stay there. In a few days, it will fall out and you will excrete it and you'll never know the difference. But while it's there, you're gonna carry around essentially a little purse that's going to be receiving a frequency and information from that. And that information is just constantly recording the what, what the pH, what, if it's an acidic environment. Um, and so when we're done, we get a printout that looks something like this. So in this example, where there's red circle there below that line, those are all incidences of reflux. Now it's important to understand that nobody's valve is perfect. Everybody should have some reflux. Um, but once we start to get above certain numbers, we do say that is pathologic. One of the benefits of a Bravo is you get multiple days of data, um, but it only detects the pH. So you only know if there's acid hitting it or not. Of course, in order for that to be effective, you need to not be taking medications that stop the reduction of acid so we can get an accurate picture of what's going on. And that means if you are on one of those PPI classes of drugs like Nexium, any of those azoles, pantoprozole, omeprazole, lansoprozole, you need to stop that seven to 10 days beforehand. You can take Pepsid in that period up until two days before, but two days before the test, you need to stop everything. So none of those medications so we can see what's going on. Uh, depending on how the test is ordered, uh, so you need to have that discussion with your ordering provider. We can choose to do it so that the first couple of days are 
off of your medication and then a few days on the medication to see how that affects your reflux as well. The second type of test to definitively diagnose acid reflux would be a 24 hour impedance study. Now, this has some benefits over a Bravo in that it can detect any kind of reflux, whether it's acidic or not. So any liquid that bounces up and hits that recorder, it can detect. Um, the downside to it is it does require a tube that goes down the nose and that will stay there for a full 24 hours. And of course you only get 24 hours of data. So which one is best for you should just be a discussion to be had with your provider. Often we'll get a swallow study as well. This is a pretty easy test to undergo. It's gonna be done through the radiology department typically, and they're gonna have you drink some contrast and then take pictures of how that goes down. So we get a better picture of the shape of your esophagus if you have a hiatal hernia and how that empties as well. Um, because it also is done in real time, we can literally capture reflux. Sometimes you can see the reflux coming up and then, of course, it'll diagnose other issues as well. Sometimes you can see evidence of a motility issue with the esophagus, which may be both contributing to symptoms or will affect the kind of surgery that we can offer you. Uh, you can see signs of obstructions or strictures that we talked about. And of course, again, that hiatal hernia. So in both of these pictures here, uh, in the first one, you can see a small hiatal hernia. And then the one on screen right is a large paraesophageal hernia where the large portion of the stomach is up in the chest and even twisted on itself. And then esophageal manometry may be recommended by your provider. So this is also known as a motility study. So this takes a thin tube and it's gonna go down your nose and sit in your stomach. So all the way down your esophagus and it's got pressure recordings on it and then you're going to swallow. So they're looking at how your esophagus squeezes every time you swallow. And this is used to diagnose any kind of motility problems that the esophagus has. Again, this is important in that it could be contributing to some of the symptoms you're experiencing, and then very important in helping us determine what kind of surgery that you may be a candidate for. When that's complete, we get a readout that looks like this and all that pretty picture is just showing what the pressure looks like as you swallow. So now that we know what the workup is like, uh, and what GERD is, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Zosa, uh, to talk to you about what your surgical treatment options are. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about some of the surgical treatment options uh, that are available. But first, um, next slide, I'd like to talk about, you know, who should really consider surgery for reflux? Um, patients who have established a diagnosis of acid reflux based on those studies that we just talked about, whose medications aren't controlling their symptoms or, you know, they're unable to tolerate the medications due to side effects, other health problems, those who don't want to be on a lifelong medication, and also those who have an anatomic problem such as a hiatal hernia that's causing their reflux. Uh, we talked about what reflux is and how medications can help lower the acid inside of the stomach. But surgery itself, um, the way that it fixes reflux is by addressing the anatomic problems and strengthening that barrier between the esophagus and the stomach to help prevent that reflux from actually um, going back up. And as we had talked about, this addresses those two main components, which involve the diaphragm, which is that muscle that separates your chest from your abdominal cavity, as well as the lower esophageal sphincter that really is that sort of high pressure kind of barrier that helps prevent acid from going up. Uh, so next I'm gonna go over the surgical um, options that are available uh, here at our institution. Um, first, I'll go over the fund application. Um, which has been uh, the gold standard operation for reflux. So this procedure um, involves returning the esophagus and the stomach to their normal anatomic positions. It, if we first tighten that uh, opening in the diaphragm that has contributed to a hiatal hernia, um, and then we create a wrap using the top part of the stomach um, to wrap around the esophagus to reinforce that lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, we're able to offer this now laparoscopically or robotically. And it also involves the creation of either a full wrap, which is on the next slide you'll see is oftentimes uh, referred to as a Nissen fund application. 
and this is sort of what it looks like endoscopically from the inside, or a partial wrap, which is seen on the next slide, or oftentimes called a toupee fundiplication. The testing that we do beforehand really helps us to determine which one patients are a best candidate for. So really, you know, why do we consider this to be the gold standard operation for reflux? Um, it's been around for a long time and we've been able to study its outcomes for many years. We know that the majority of patients, 84%, um, return to normal acid levels after undergoing this procedure. And most of them, only 16% six, only of patients uh, were still even taking a PPI to help control some of their symptoms. And as you can see, really the biggest thing is that, you know, 96% of patients would say they would have this surgery again. So, you know, while the fund application is still the gold standard and the most common operation we perform for reflux, there are other, other no novel devices that are being used as well. Uh, one of those options is the Lynx or magnetic sphincter augmentation. It's a ring of magnetic beads that is placed surgically around the esophagus. Um, it offers the advantages of a GI barrier with a more favorable side effect profile with the ability to belch and less bloating. Um, however, only if certain patients who, you know, don't have any problems with their motility or swallowing function of the esophagus should have this, which is another really important reason that, you know, people go undergo the tests uh, that we discussed before to make sure each individual has the options that are appropriate for them. And here's what the uh, magnetic ring looks like from inside the body. Early outcomes are pretty favorable for this procedure with 85% of patients having, you know, more than 50% uh, decrease in the acid reflux in their esophagus and 89% coming off of their proton pump inhibitors and significant improvement in quality of life. Another option is the TIF or transoral incisionless fund application. Uh, this is an endoscopic procedure that creates a partial wrap from inside the stomach. This does not require any incisions and does offer the advantage of a short recovery. Uh, but many patients that also have a hiatal hernia will require a combined procedure uh, known as a CTIF, which also involves uh, the repair of the hiatal hernia um, surgically. Um, the outcomes on this are still fairly new, and we're actually currently actively researching um, the outcomes for these procedures here at Hopkins. Early data does show significant improvement in people's quality of life and the ability to come off of medications. And lastly, I'd like to mention the Ruin Y gastric bypass, which we know is a really effective anti reflux operation especially for people who also have morbid obesity that is, you know, we define as a BMI over 35. Um, heartburn is significantly improved in this population and it also offers the additional health benefits and weight loss. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for the, uh, joining us this evening um, and to my partners for you know, uh, their presentation. Um, please let us know whatever questions you have and we're happy to answer. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zosa and Dr. Coker for those great presentations. So um, what we've shared with you so far is really just a background about acid reflux. Um, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of us have heartburn from time to time. Um, particularly like after that big Thanksgiving meal and you lay back on the couch and watch football, we're all going to have reflux. But folks who suffer that um, day after day um, really could benefit from uh, treatment. Our first line is really medical treatment, but you saw in this presentation that there's some patients who need um, surgery, either uh, because the medication is not enough, that valve is very leaky, or there's a hiatal hernia that's not supporting the esophagus. And so uh, that's what we want to share with you today. So um, Dr. Uh, Zosa, how do you decide whether to do a full or partial wrap? So really I make that decision um, based on a patient's anatomy and I really rely on that test of the manometry which lets me know how does the esophagus function. Um, patients whose esophagus doesn't squeeze appropriately 
Um, those are the patients that I really counsel to have a partial wrap so that we ensure that um, their swallow function uh, is not as effective. Um, Dr. Coker, what surgical option would you choose for somebody who has poor esophageal motility? You know, a lot of it depends on the degree of that, um, and that's taken into account not just the numbers that you see in, you know, the studies that you get done, but also the degree of their symptoms. So if it's someone who is reporting a lot of difficulty swallowing, that may affect my decision. Um, but for the most part, someone who doesn't have um, great evidence of esophageal squeezing, um, I would probably recommend a partial wrap for them if they really needed an anti-reflux barrier. Um, we've talked um, really about the benefits of the surgery. Um, can you share some of the risks? We know overall that the risk of complications for these procedures that were described is low, um, similar to getting your gallbladder out. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a relatively low risk procedure, but like anything, there are some minor side effects that you can expect. And I always say, you know, this is elective surgery. And so it's kind of weighing the risk and benefits. And when you feel that the benefits outweigh the risk. So one of the potential side effects is that new wrap that we create, just like it's going to keep that acid from bouncing back up. Um, it can keep some of the air from coming up easily as well. And that can lead to an increased bloating sensation in some patients. Uh, to combat that, we do recommend that you avoid introducing air to the abdomen. So that means avoiding the use of straws, avoiding a lot of carbonated beverages, and even having a lot of large leafy greens at once. Um, that being said, again, it's, it's uh, kind of risk versus benefits. And I've had patients that, you know, when you have bad reflux, you're just miserable with it. Um, and patients that have come to me and said, yeah, I have a little bit increased bloating, but like, I'll take that any day over the horrible heartburn I was having before. So they're still very satisfied with the procedure, but I do have to warn everyone is because that air is not going up. It has to go somewhere. So there is an increased flatulence rate that can be associated with this when you do have air in there, but I've never had anyone complain about it. Um, other than that, it's relatively low risk. And like I said, there's a high satisfaction rate associated with it. There was actually a study done, I guess it was probably five years ago now. Like we can talk about, you know, what we feel about it as surgeons all day long. But what I liked about this study was that it was just a survey sent to patients. So just people like you that had reflux and they underwent an anti-reflux procedure and basically said, how satisfied are you with this procedure? And of people having, uh, this was specifically with fundoplications or the stomach rafts, both full and partial, said, are you satisfied? And 90% of them said, yes, they're satisfied. And even the 10 of the 10% that said they were dissatisfied, I think there was 30% of them that said they would still undergo it again. So whatever was, you know, maybe they were, weren't able to fully come off their medication and they were partly dissatisfied with that, but they would still undergo the procedure. And I think those are pretty compelling numbers. So if you're getting to a point where you're just miserable with your reflux, uh, your medications aren't working for you, or you just don't want to be on those medications every day, I think it's something that you should at least consult with a surgeon about to see if you would be a candidate uh, and that you would be happy with it. Yeah, I, I um, agree with that as well. I think some of the gas and bloating and Dr. Zosa can chime in too is um, a lot of patients, you know, with acid reflux develop this habit, which they might not even be aware of it, where they're swallowing air. So, you know, we're all social beings and, and you're out in, in public or at a dinner and you feel that reflux bubbling up and we'll kind of swallow to um, keep that reflux down. And if you continue that sort of air swallowing, um, what happens with that valve creation when you do, uh, for instance, the full wrap or even the partial wrap is when the stomach is full, that wrap is designed to tighten. And so um, if you're taking, swallowing a lot of air with carbonated beverages or um, using a straw or those gas producing foods and your stomach's filling up with air, that valve will tighten. And so you might feel bloated and that gas might come out the other way, as Dr. Coker said. Um, so, uh, Dr. Zosi, you shared some alternative treatments. Um, you mentioned uh, the TIF, which was designed to be sort of even a, a less invasive method of uh, treatment for acid reflux than um, the laparoscopic or robotic approach. 
Um, and you also um, uh, talked about the links as well. Can you just highlight again, clarify about who is most eligible um, for those? Does it really shorten the recovery time uh, for patients? Um, are they still have to adhere to this diet that Dr. Uh, Coker um, mentioned? Yeah, so, um, you know, thank you. Both of those are, you know, sort of very unique uh, procedures. Um, the TIF, which is an endoscopic procedure, is, you know, definitely a shorter recovery if you're able to qualify for it. Um, but it is highly selective. So patients that have, you know, really any sort of sizable hiatal hernia um, are not candidates for just a TIF. Those patients really would require the combination procedure of a TIF with the laparoscopic hiatal hernia approach, because the TIF itself is only working to reinforce that lower esophageal sphincter, but it doesn't address the diaphragm problem. So that's why those two procedures are oftentimes required together. Um, and that has a similar recovery actually to a laparoscopic fund duplication with a similar diet um, postoperatively. The lynx itself um, is a little bit different in terms of sort of the postoperative recovery. Um, oftentimes this can be done um, as an outpatient procedure in select patients. Um, really patients that are eligible for this are those who have normal esophageal um, motility or normal swallowing function. That's really important. Um, and the sort of post-operative diet that changes for these patients compared to others is because it's a magnetic sphincter that's sort of um, opening and closing as food goes through. You actually want to encourage uh, frequent solid meals early on to sort of prevent that from being too tight. Um, so that is, the Lynx is, um, you know, an implanted device, so we're not using uh, the patient's own tissue. Um, do you have any uh, concerns about that? Are there patients who aren't eligible for that procedure besides having poor um, esophagus movement or motility? Right, so that's kind of, you know, my first consideration, but also, you know, patients who need to have frequent MRIs um, to monitor, you know, certain conditions. Um, it's important, you know, people who've got really severe esophagitis, so a lot of inflammation in that area, you don't want to go putting, you know, a foreign body. Um, we do know that sort of, you know, the, imp the removal rate for these is pretty low. Um, so they have been shown to be uh, safe with the data that we have out there, uh, but definitely a concern for sort of people that might be at higher risk for having a lot of, you know, scarring in that area. I guess uh, patients who have uh, nickel allergies or metal sensitivities might not be candidates for it too. Correct. Yeah. Dr. Coker, one of the questions in the audience is what procedure uh, would we recommend uh, to be medication free? What would give a patient the best chance for that and uh, more money in their pocket? <laughs> That's a tough one. I mean, I think all of these medications so far are at least showing, or all these procedures, I should say, are at least showing um, promise in letting a patient reach that. But I would have to say, you know, that if you want the best data, we have the most data, and that's why we consider it the gold standard on fundoplication, so on stomach wraps. Um, Lynx has been around for a while now, but still really new compared to fundoplication. Um, and same thing, TIF is even newer than that. So I would have to say uh, a lot of our TIF patients at this point, um, we kind of do understudy protocols um, as we're still trying to figure out longevity of that procedure. Whereas the fundoplication, we know that it works and there's a really good success rate with it. I generally think I'm even on the high end of things when I quote my patients that there's probably about a 20% chance they may still need some form of medication, um, but it's pretty much uniformly never as severe as what they were on before. I mean, we see people with horrible reflux that are on the proton pump inhibitors morning and night and a, a H2 blocker in the evening as well. And so when I see these patients, I'm like, I promise you, you will not be on that after this procedure. It's possible you may just need some occasional medication after that. Um, usually my patients are doing very well and often they'll tell me they have to take that occasional medication when they're like, yeah, I knew I ate something horrible because as you said, Dr. Drallis, all of us, 
you know, when you eat certain things or choose to eat too much, that valve and even your wrap can only handle so much and you'll have some reflux. Um, but I mean, I'd love to hear you guys' opinion. Personally, for me, it would be recommending a fundoplication. I would agree with that. I think, I think just as Dr. Zosa shared, the Nissen fundoplication is considered a gold standard and probably, you know, for a reason. It's been around the longest and has the longest track record. Um, now, a hiatal hernia can recur. Um, it's not, um, you know, 0%. Um, so there are certain things, of course, that we um, counsel patients on to try to reduce that risk of hiatal hernia occurrence, like, um, you know, watching and monitoring your weight um, and so forth that might increase the risk. Um, but overall, I think it's a strong procedure that lasts for a while. And I think, you know, as a surgeon, it's really rewarding. I think, you, you know, we do these procedures. Most often, um, the patients go home the next day. Um, one of the audience members asked about what the recovery times were um, for each of them. So uh, the TIF uh, is really done more as an outpatient, but the other procedures often um, is just in one night stay. And um, people are amazed the next day. Gosh, I didn't have any heartburn. I laid down flat. That was the first time I've, I've slept flat yeah. in a really long time. Um, they might chew something a little bit on the acidic side, you know, when they drink their liquids the next day that they haven't had in years. So that part, I think, of uh, treating patients with um, reflux is really rewarding. Um, there was a, um, an audience member who asked about gastric bypass, and, and that certainly is a very good operation for acid reflux and bile reflux. It is more involved. I'd say um, it doesn't, they asked about, does it recreate a lower esophageal sphincter? It doesn't do that. What it does is really disconnect um, the, um, the majority of the stomach that is producing acid, um, as well as um, you know, diverting the bile. So it's a more involved procedure. It wouldn't be our go-to procedure, I don't think, for acid you know, reflux. But in somebody who's had other procedures or if they would benefit from gastric bypass, um, let's say someone has obesity um, and might have added benefit for having gastric um, bypass besides the treatment of acid reflux, it's a really excellent operation for that. If someone's had... Um, uh, fundoplication before and had recurrent hiatal hernias, and um, uh, then we also might consider gastric bypass for those patients too. I don't know if um, either of you have thoughts about that. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to note though that, yeah, we wouldn't recommend this um, for a patient that didn't also suffer from obesity necessarily. It wouldn't be a, a first line treatment for reflux alone. Um, and because there are a lot of other metabolic changes that can come with it um, and dietary changes that would need to occur. Uh, but for people who have particularly uh, a hiatal hernia and suffer from obesity, I think it's an excellent option. I agree completely. Um, one of the audience members asked, would you recommend diagnostic studies to confirm silent acid reflux? I mean, I'll let you guys give your opinions too, but if you're not having any symptoms, um, I think it's hard to justify undergoing uh, testing for that. Um, I, if you have a, a strong family history of something like esophageal cancer, I can certainly understand uh, the desire to have that looked at. Um, but where you might have what's considered somewhat silent reflux in the terms that you don't have typical symptoms, like the heartburn and the regurgitation, the reflux, there are atypical symptoms of GERD. Um, and that often includes symptoms like chronic cough and throat irritation and um, aspiration, uh, meaning that while you typically while you sleep, some of that acid that's come up actually goes down into your trachea and your windpipe um, and can cause damage to your lungs over time. So sometimes people present um, with somewhat silent reflux in terms of, I don't have any heartburn, but their pulmonary, their lung function is decreasing over time, in which case it's certainly under worth going testing to make sure that that's not contributing. Um, Dr. Zosa, um, there's some questions here in the chat about the longevity of these procedures. How long do the effects last? Is it lifelong? Does it need to be repeated at some point? Could you comment on that? 
Yeah, so, you know, as we have all discussed, we probably have the most data understanding about the uh, Nissen and partial fund application. And those can last lifelong. We do know that a small percentage of patients can have a recurrence, but very few patients actually need to have another operation um, in their lifetime to correct this. Uh, for the other devices, such as the LYNX and the TIF, uh, our, under, you know, our data is still pretty early. We have about you know, five and 10 year data on these procedures. So it's hard to know sort of long-term whether or not someone will need um, another procedure. Um, with the LYNX itself, it's a device that's there for life. Um, so, you know, unless it causes problems down the line, uh, so far, it's not something that needs to be revised. On um, the TIF procedure, the, like I said, you know, the early data is pretty good about, you know, not needing to have repeat procedures, but um, really we won't know for several years out what the, you know, true long-term data is. I have a question, Dr. Jones. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If you were to Google fundoplication or stomach graft, I think you might find some scary stuff out there. Um, so I guess tell me why, you know, coming to see you, why I should feel comfortable getting this procedure done, you know, with someone who's minimally invasive surgery trained, for example. I, I think just like, um, you know, considering other surgeries or procedures, even medical treatments, we have to think about the risks and benefits. So as you highlight, actually, the medicines alone, they're not completely benign. Actually, when the medications, the um, pr proton pump inhibitors, Nexium and, and um, uh, Prevacid, for example, when those are approved by the FDA, they're actually approved for like use for two weeks. No one ever envisioned that people would need them for so long. Um, and overall, as you highlighted too, the safety profile is really, um, is very good. And people have been on them for years and years. Um, but we know that there are some side effects just like any other medication. And it, it isn't for everybody and, and particularly patients who have kidney disease. Um, and there's some correlation, not really great causality, um, you know, associations with things like a whole host of things from Alzheimer's to cardiac. So when you think about all treatments, whether it's medications or surgery, there's always risk and benefit. I think um, certainly if I was uh, Googling, you're always gonna hear from sort of the loudest person and the person with the most concern. You don't always hear from a cheerleader. And so you really have to um, filter that and, and come with a grain of salt. I think what we do as surgeons and what I would do as a patient too is really look at all the options and look at my quality of life and figure out what was best um, for me about um, you know how severe my, my acid reflux is and if I'm getting enough benefit for it. Um, over time, one thing that we didn't really talk about was that over time, these symptoms can become silent. Sometimes the esophagus becomes so um, inflamed or dead in the nerve sensitivity is less so that um, some patients can have really bad acid reflux and not know how bad it's progressed. And, um, and we probably don't, this is just my own personal opinion, maybe we aren't screening people enough. Um, you know, uh, we screen folks for colon cancer, which is so important, but there is a rise in the number of people who are developing esophageal cancer. Um, and primarily that's not related to the kind of cancer that's related to smoking or alcohol, but it's related to acid reflux. And we have here in the surgery treatment, a uh, treatment that is very effective. Um, so yes, if I had really bad acid reflux and the medication, I would start with medications because that's simplest and certainly less invasive. But if that wasn't working for me and it certainly feels to affect my quality of life, I definitely would consider surgery. Um, now, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was a long-winded answer. I, I guess I wanted to go into, um, because some of making that decision is how it's gonna affect your life afterward. And there are some questions here that I, I wanna make sure we get to, which is, can you eat a normal diet afterward? Do you still need to avoid certain trigger foods? Um, you know, what else could cause someone to intake excess air? Um, and um, I, I'd like to hear both your thoughts about that. I could think that, you know, all of us can um, 
sometimes we don't eat as well as we should. You know, sometimes we're eating fast on the run. But, um, and so what we're recommending for eating, and this holds for somebody who has a, you know, has to reflux surgery or doesn't, is to actually have good eating behavior where you're chewing well and sitting upright and taking your time. And that's good for all of us. And so, um, in my opinion, you can eat a normal diet afterward. Should you continue to eat in a good way? Yes, you should. I agree. I think if you're undergoing this, one of the biggest reasons you're doing it is for quality of life, right? Um, and so we're hoping that it improves your quality of life. And that means that you can have some chocolate every now and then, you know, or maybe, maybe a little glass of wine and it won't give you horrible reflux, right? Um, like you said, anyone, if we overdo it uh, in, a, in a bad way, you're, you're going to suffer a little bit, uh, regardless of whether you've had surgery or not. But uh, I want you to enjoy your life. Yeah, exactly. And I think everyone is sort of an individual and sort of after you get out of that initial recovery phase, um, it's okay to try those foods that, you know, used to give you reflux and see how things go. And that's one of the benefits, I think, is that hopefully with these surgeries, um, for the right patient, you know, if we've um, selected out patients who will benefit, then uh, they can return to the things that they like to do, um, including foods that they like to eat. Um, but that's also part of a good evaluation. I mean, I would be wary about going to a surgeon who just offers the surgery to you and doesn't actually get to know you better. And that means though they're not that fun, some of these studies that Dr. Cooker highlighted to do, but it does give us really great information so we can tailor an operation, you know, for each individual patient. Um, and then hopefully in doing that way, you know, we can get the best outcome. Yeah, I agree. I just say, I like to operate. <laughs> I enjoy it. Uh, I get paid to operate but I want to offer an operation to the person that will benefit from it and make sure I give them the right operation. Uh, and yes, some, unfortunately, sometimes that means undergoing some testing. And I totally agree. I'd be wary of anyone who would just say, Hey, let's rush to the operating room. Um, and kind of going back to that question I was asking you, I've, I've been asked that question of, uh, if you had acid reflux, would you undergo one of these surgeries? Like, you know, and what would it be? And, and the answer is I absolutely would but I would make sure I chose my surgeon wisely. You know, I would have one of you do it. Um, and I think there's a big difference to be said. A lot of these uh, surgeries that you hear about, the people the squeaky wheels that do have a bad outcome, they're not necessarily going to people who are fellowship trained like we were to do this, that we, all of us here, spent a, at least a year of our life perfecting this skill and understanding this disease process and how to do the operation. Um, and there's a lot of surgeons in the community that didn't. And I'm not saying you can't potentially get a good outcome from that. Um, but I think I would want someone who I knew had really devoted a lot of their life to doing this procedure and does it in high volume. I think that's important. I agree with that. Um, Dr. Joseph, um, one of the questions is, could an irritation sensation in your stomach be related to acid reflux? And then another um, question is, um, so if PPIs and antacids are no longer working, is surgery the last resort? Is that the next step? Um, so I would say, you know, an irritation sensation in your stomach definitely could be related to acid reflux. Um, we know that, you know, especially with patients who have a hiatal hernia, oftentimes that top part of the stomach is sliding up and down above the diaphragm. And that can be an irritating feeling, not necessarily um, the typical heartburn symptom that we, um, you know, relate with this. Um, when medications really are no longer working, I think it is valuable to at least consider surgery as an option because we do know that it is effective uh, for patients who have, you know, that documented reflux who medications aren't working. Do you have any other thoughts about that, Dr. Hooper? I think that you should absolutely at least consult with a surgeon at that point um, to see what your options are. I think it is important that you have a full workup and you're sure that um, you do have reflux because um, a lot of times the medications do work pretty well. Um, and in full transparency, a lot of times the people who have the best results with these surgeries are the ones that also respond well to it. 
Um, and so if you're not responding at all to an anti-acid medication, it would make me a little bit concerned that maybe there was something else going on. So I think it'd be important to investigate that. Um, but certainly there are plenty of patients I've had that have been on medications and they've just lost effectiveness over time. Um, and I think, you know, they benefited from surgery. I also have a lot of patients who maybe only, you know, they've kind of burned through them and they've got to the point where only the most expensive, you know, prescription only medications work. Um, but maybe some of the people on this call have experienced that, but then their insurance companies start saying that they're not going to pay for it. And they're frankly, very expensive to pay for yourself. And so they're certainly interested in having surgery to avoid that. Um, and then also that group of patients who respond very well to their medication, but, and I, and I totally get it. They're just like, I don't want to take a medication every day. You know, that's, that's not me. That's not the life I want. Um, and if, if I can give them a surgery so they can avoid that and, and feel confident that it's very low risk to do so, then I'm happy to offer that. Yeah, the medications do work very well, especially the PPI, so Nexium, Prevacid, and the like. And, um, and so those are designed really to just block the acid pumps in the stomach. But our bodies are amazing, and our stomachs make more acid pumps. And so that's really why folks, you know, they start on a lower dose, and then they find out that they have to go up on the dose, or um, now, you know, they were just taking it in the morning, now they have to take it in the evening also. And at some point it becomes ineffective. So the fluid um, might be less acidic, um, but it's that mechanical issue of that leaky valve, you know, or that, um, that anti-reflux barrier that we talked about that um, needs some adjustment. And so that's where the hiatal hernia repair and the wrap procedure that Dr. Zosa talked about is so important. Um, one of the um, questions here is, what is the difference between MIS surgeons and GI surgeons as it relates to GERD? Um, I don't know if one of you wants to answer that. I, I think I that maybe it's MIS surgeon and gastroenterology is what they're referring to. So I, well, I think there are surgeons who specialize in the GI tract. Um, so maybe they're referring to that, or maybe um, also there are gastroenterologists who are not surgeons by training, meaning they wouldn't make cuts on you, um, but they can be uh, what we call interventionalists. So they can do procedures like TIF. Um, and so th those are kind of very different things. I will say often we work very closely together um, uh, as Dr. Zos was saying, you know, um, some of our group does offer TIF as well or work with our GI doctors when they are unable to offer that because of your anatomy and you need surgery and they refer to us. Um, so we work very closely together. Most of my patients are referred to me by a lot of our gastroenterologists. Um, if you're asking about the difference between GI surgeons and minimally invasive surgeons, though, really I'd say a lot of times that's one and the same. So most minimally invasive surgeons are experts in what we call foregut, which is the first part of the GI tract. Yeah, I think one of the reasons I was so happy to recruit both of you to join me at Hopkins is um, just the expertise that you have both in surgery as well as the experience with endoscopy. Um, so it's nice to be able to have all those tools in your toolbox um, so that when a patient comes, you know, you're well versed in, in figuring out what that, you know, best solution is for that particular patient. Um, one of the um, audience members asked about how does stress affect GERD? There's definitely a mind-gut connection for sure. Um, Dr. Sosa, do you want to um, answer that one, tackle that one a bit? Um, I mean, I think we all know that stress sort of has an effect on every single part of the body um, and definitely exacerbates um, acid reflux and GERD, as well as a whole host of other things. Um, and oftentimes too, we know when we're stressed, we're not eating well. You know, you're off, at least for me, I know when I'm stressed, uh, you're not eating the right things, eating at bad times. Um, and all of that definitely contributes to not feeling well and having reflux. Yeah, and I think um, certainly, uh, you know, things like anxiety or stress um, often can cause some irritation in the esophagus or spasm in the esophagus. Um, 
Sometimes that can be mistaken for acid reflux, um, and uh, but it's more of a primary movement issue with the esophagus itself, and not necessarily that acid is coming up from the esophagus. So again, it is um, important to do those diagnostic tests that we talked about. I think one um, nice thing about the Bravo study or the catheter study that you shared, Dr. Cooper, is that um, by measuring the acid um, or bile that's coming up and um, sort of correlating that to patient's symptoms, we can give a patient a little better idea of, okay, if I have this issue, is it related to the times where I'm actually having acid reflux? And if it is, then we know a little bit better, okay, if we treat that acid reflux, then this symptom you know, may improve. It's not a perfect um, match, but it does help us um, answer some of those questions to help patients make decisions. Excellent point. Um, what is the relationship between GERD and Barrett's esophagus? So we know that um, acid reflux, so acid is intended to be in the stomach, right? It's actually not intended to be in our esophagus. And so what can happen over time is when your esophagus is exposed to this high acid that doesn't belong there, oftentimes it'll actually change the structure of the cells. Um, of the esophagus to try and adapt to that environment that it's being exposed to. And we know that down the line over time, Barrett's esophagus can also put people at risk for developing cancer. So yeah, if you, if you have Barrett's, then often we won't get those pH studies if you've already have a diagnosis of Barrett's because we know you have reflux, that the reflux has caused this. Um, that is a long-term sequelae or consequence of reflux. Um, and at that point, that's when I, you know, it's still a personal decision. Some people stay on their medication, but you have to have some kind of treatment. Your, your body has already shown a dramatic change in response to the reflux. So your only real options at that point are to stay on your medications for life. Um, regardless of whether you're having symptoms or not, because you can't afford to have more damage that it causes that Barrett's to go on to become esophageal cancer. Because um, again, I think we've said it tonight already, but just stressing the number one cause of esophageal cancer in this country is GERD. Um, so this is not a benign condition, um, long-term if left untreated. Um, so again, if you have Barrett's, you have to stay on your medication or have surgery, you know, some kind of anti-reflux procedure performed on you um, with the hope of getting good enough control that then you can come off of your medication. And that may be the one category for patients. I mean, one advantage of having these surgical or endoscopic procedures for acid reflux is to come off medications. But in someone who has Barrett's, um, there are some gastroenterologists and surgeons who decide together with the patient that um, it might be best to stay also on at least a low dose acid reducing plus the procedure, kind of like a belts and suspenders approach um, to the Barrett's just to help um, keep it from progressing. We're sort of ending toward or, or moving toward the end of our time together. Um, so I wanna make sure that um, we get to these, um, uh, this last uh, question here. So um, one of the questions is we mentioned GERD can cause breathing problems. Um, would this be similar to asthma? And I would say um, yes. And in fact, um, sometimes when we see someone who, um, I always raise a concern of acid reflux when somebody uh, didn't as a child or younger adult have acid ref you know, have asthma, and then they develop, you know, as an adult, a new diagnosis of asthma. That's when it sort of raises our um, eyebrows to think, oh, uh, this might be acid reflux. Um, and, um, and it can, you know, cause a chronic inflammation over time if untreated in the lungs. And oftentimes we find that patients, you know, sometimes just have a symptom of having a chronic cough or lots of phlegm um, can also present the sort of some of the problems that are related to reflux kind of going into the upper parts. Um, of the esophagus and getting into the lungs and airways. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. I think I've really enjoyed um, the panel being here with uh, Dr. Zosa and Dr. Coker. 
Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in. I encourage anyone who has further questions to um, schedule an appointment with us. Um, we're happy to see you. And um, we look forward to helping you with your herd symptoms. Thank you. Thank you.